Our gospel reading for today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will, will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. Well, there seem to be some unwritten rules in life. Rules that we've never specifically made, you know, set in stone or made official in any way, but yet rules that many of us still try to follow. Rules such as when it's appropriate to talk politics or when it's appropriate to talk religion. Rules such as if you're going to pet somebody's dog, you should ask first. Rules such as if you're going to go to the store and use a shopping cart, you should take that shopping cart back to the cart return and not leave it in the middle of the parking lot for the next person. And then, of course, there's the unwritten rule as to when it becomes appropriate to listen to Christmas music. And this is a very polarizing, unwritten rule. Now, as we get into this, I want to make a distinction. I understand that there's a difference between Advent music and Christmas music. We have Advent music, which is all about the anticipation of the arrival of Jesus. We're calling out to Jesus, saying, Come, Lord Jesus, come. All right, this is where we get songs such as, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. Those are our Advent songs. Then you have your, your Christmas songs, the songs that celebrate the arrival of Jesus. This is where many of our famous Christmas carols come from, songs like uh, Silent Night and Away in a Manger and so many others. So I understand there's a distinction between the two, but just for the sake of conversation for the next minute or so, we're going to put them all together. Because as we get in this, as we get into this, I don't want to go any further into the service without trying to settle this unwritten rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a few different camps of people here for a second and how they prefer their Christmas music. And when I describe you, I want you to raise your hand. So first, you have those who say, absolutely no Christmas music until December 1st. Raise your hand if that's you. Bah humbug to you guys as well. And then you have the group that's maybe a little bit more lenient. They say, hey, you know what? I want to get through Thanksgiving. And then, after Thanksgiving, then, then I can listen to my Christmas music. Raise your hand if that's you. Okay, I think that's probably the most popular approach. And then there's a special group, the few, the proud, the brave, who say, I don't care what the calendar says. When I want my Christmas music, I am going to listen to my Christmas music. Anybody brave enough to admit it? Good for you guys. Good for you. Now, I myself, I tend to be in that, that post-Thanksgiving uh, camp. I, I love Thanksgiving, so I want Thanksgiving to have its moment, and then after that, then I move on to Christmas. But I will admit that there have been some times in, in, in mid-November, early November, where I've been in the car, and I've had my, my phone plugged in, and it's shuffling through songs, and one thing leads to another, and then it's just... Just me and Mariah, belting out the duet to All I Want for Christmas. And it's not the worst thing. It feels good every once in a while. Now, of all of these Christmas songs, we've got so many great Christmas songs. 
I want to I wanna talk about one that I think is, is maybe my favorite, and that song is Mary, Did You Know? This is a really simple yet profound song. It's a song in which the author asks uh, Mary a, a, a series of questions, a series of questions saying, hey, Mary, did, did you know about this thing? Mary, did you ever think about this thing? Mary, did you ever consider this thing? It's a series of questions, and it also it's set in a minor key, so it's just, it's just a little bit chilling. But I think what this song does the best is it really makes us ponder this miracle, this miraculous thing that happens on Christmas morning. So the words are on the screen. I'm going to read the beginning just to kind of emphasize this. The song begins like this. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know? Doesn't it really make you think? Doesn't it make you wonder? Doesn't it make you, you question all of these different things? You know, what's really interesting to me is this song, it's typically about four minutes long. It's four minutes long. It asks over a dozen questions or so of Mary. And in those four minutes, not one single question ever gets answered, which then leaves us as the audience to try to answer those questions for ourselves. So as we listen to it, we really have to wonder, well, what did Mary know? Did Mary know anything other than what Gabriel told her? When did Mary begin to see things? When did Mary begin to understand things? Now, this Advent season, this time leading up to Christmas, we are going to do a sermon series in which we are going to take a a new way each week to prepare our hearts for the arrival of Jesus on Christmas. And this week, we're going to do what we're already doing. We're going to ponder. We're going to think. And we are going to reflect. And then in the coming weeks, we're also going to be praying, praising, and then proclaiming. But for today, our, our key word here is, is pondering. Now, just as an aside, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. I love football. I love the Chicago Bears. It is a curse that I live with, but it is, it's me. Now, I love the Chicago Bears. I watch every single game. I watch every minute of every single game. Throughout the week, I listen to the radio. I listen to podcasts. I'm listening to all this stuff about the Chicago Bears. On Sunday, when they play, I like to listen to the pregame show, hear them talk about the strategy that's going to be played out. After the game, I turn it back on. I like to listen to the postgame show. Now, here's the thing. The postgame show, I listen to it. I turn it on. I could probably do without it. I probably don't need it because I've heard it called this, this great term called coach speak. Coach speak is when the coach comes out and is asked the same questions that they've been asked week after week for the most part, and then they give the same answers that they've given week after week. It's just a whole bunch of things that we've all heard that person say before. So when it comes to terms of the, uh, the post-game show, I don't always listen to that one because I've heard it all so many times before, I don't have to think about it. Don't have to question it. Don't have to ponder it. Today, as we get into this story of of Gabriel visiting Mary, I know that we have all heard this story before. I'm I'm encouraging us today, don't tune it out. It's not coach speak. It's not pastor speak. I promise, stay with me. We're going to ponder this together. Now, as we do that, as we ponder this, I think it's important that we, we look at this story in its full context, because this is not an ordinary story. This is not like just your average Tuesday for Mary or for anybody else. This is wild stuff. Here we have Mary. She's a young girl. She's probably 13 or 14, somewhere in that ballpark. She's a very young, young girl. And she's visited by an angel. All of a sudden, Gabriel's there. She's standing in front of a heavenly being. And this angel is there to deliver a message to her that she is going to have a child All of a sudden, an angel is in the room with with Mary saying, congratulations, Mary, you're pregnant, right? This is is unbelievable. This is impossible stuff. And not only is she pregnant with, with just any child, this child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And because this child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, this child is going to be the Son of God. 
And as the Son of God, God is going to raise up this child to sit on the throne of David, a throne in which he will have the kingdom, and the kingdom then will have no end. This is, this is not normal stuff. This is stuff that sounds impossible. And on top of that, you've got Mary, who is betrothed to Joseph. Joseph is the, essentially her fiancé. Can you imagine what's going through Mary's head as she's, she's taking all of this information in? She knows that you know, on the side, like there's, there's Joseph. She's probably wondering, how am I going to explain this to Joseph? How does Mary even begin that conversation? Does she go to Joseph and say, Joseph, I hope you're sitting down for this, because this sounds impossible. Right? So there's so much going on here, and here is the amazing part. Mary has taken all of this in. She's standing in front of an, an angel. The angel tells her that she's going to have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. The child is going to be the long-promised Savior, and here is the, the response that Mary gives. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. After everything that she has just been told, that is the response that she is able to give. I don't know about you, I read that and I just think, Mary, are you kidding me? How are you keeping this all together? Your world has just been rocked. This may have always have been God the Father's plan. There's no way that this was Mary's plan. So how does she keep it all together? Because I know that when, when my plans get changed, plans that are much smaller, I respond in ways that are way worse than what Mary has done here. If I'm at Starbucks and they tell me, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have that anymore, I am annoyed because why do things have to be so hard? If I'm out on the road and I'm driving and the person in front of me is going too slow, I am bothered. Why doesn't anybody just know how to drive these days? If, if, I, if I'm told by somebody, hey, you know that thing I told you I was going to do? I didn't get it done then I'm not happy because that probably means that's one more thing that I have to do that day. But what does Mary say? She says, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. What if that was the response that we gave every time our plans changed? What if that was the response that we gave every time life got just a little bit harder? What if that was the response that we gave every time life felt impossible. Now, when Mary says this, Mary is not just responding to what is going to happen. Mary is also responding to the way in which things are going to happen. Gabriel comes and he gives this, this whole message to Mary, and this is how Gabriel ends his, his, his message. He says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. This sounds a lot like a verse that we hear in Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 which says, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. All right, this is probably the most popular confirmation verse in the history of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Every year, if you've got at least 10 kids getting confirmed, 25% of them are, are going to pick this verse. And these are the words of the Apostle Paul. Sadly, and unfortunately, many times, these words from Paul are, are misunderstood. They're taken out of context. A lot of times we hear those words and we think, Anything that I want to do, I can do it. I can get it done. Anything that I want to achieve, I can make it happen. Want to be a millionaire? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Want to be a professional athlete? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But if you read it, you read the whole thing, you can see that that's not really the point that Paul is making. Because in the verses prior to this, Paul says this, which should be on the screen. For I have learned in whatever situation... I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So how is it that Mary is able to receive this unbelievable message and yet give such a simple and beautiful and faithful response? She's able to do this because she is resting in the truth and the promise that nothing is impossible with her God. And this is not just a statement about what she believes that she can achieve. This is a statement about something that's more about what we know we can endure, what we know we can go through, what we know Christ is going to walk with us through. For example, virgin birth. He's got it. Maintaining a relationship with Joseph throughout all of this. 
He's got it. Establishing the king and heaven, the king of heaven and earth. He's got it. All of these things he can do. He has got it. Now, each one of us comes, comes here each week. We wake up each morning with, with something on our hearts, something on our minds, something that, that, like Mary, is feeling, something that just feels impossible. Relationship issues that feel like they can never, ever be mended. Mistakes that we feel like we could just never, ever be forgiven for. Mistakes that we feel like maybe we will never allow ourselves to get past. Tasks that are piling up that we think, there's no way I could ever complete all of these things that have been put on my plate. But this morning, as we read this story of of Gabriel and, and Mary, we are reminded that we have the God of possible. Jesus makes it possible. There's never been a time in which Jesus has looked at a situation and said, you know what? It's too much. It's too big. I can't do it. He's never looked at something and said, it can't be done. Even when we were dead in our sin, Jesus made it possible. He said, I know how to fix this. He looks at us and he says, I know exactly what you need right now. He looks at you and he says, I will walk with you through this thing that you are experiencing right now. And he doesn't just say it, but he acts on it. And that's why Jesus is born on Christmas morning. That's why Jesus lives the way that he lives for his lifetime. That's why Jesus goes to the cross for us. That's why Jesus walks out of the empty tomb for us, because he is the God of possible. And so this Christmas season, as as you ponder this, As you ponder the meaning of Christmas, as you ponder Jesus' birth, let us rest in that truth that all things are possible through our God. And so now we go to him in prayer. Jesus, you are the God of possible. As we reflect on your birth, specifically through the witness of your mother Mary, we are reminded of your goodness. Help us to rest in your promises, knowing that in all circumstances, the good ones and the bad ones, you walk beside us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.